Hello, thank you for stopping by my channel. In this problem, we have flexible plate A, B, C, D, A, B, C, D. We see it in two dimensions over here. That drawing is in the X, Y plane. And over here, we basically can see the context in full three dimensions. So here is X, this way is Y. Flexible plate ABCD is fillet welded to some type of a support structure. In other words, we're going to assume that this line that connects A and B is a line of fixity or a fixed plane. Let's zoom back out. And since this is a flexible plate, we want to get a visual on what those deformations could look like. So I'm going to switch my layer over, grab my transform tool, and as those forces are applied in, in plane, this greatly exaggerated depiction shows where points C Right in the undeformed geometry was here, it's moved over here. That means we're going to call that one C prime. And point D moved over here. In that deformed location, we'll call that D prime. Meanwhile, point A hasn't moved, point B hasn't moved. In fact, all points on this line of fixity, this fixed plane where our flexible plate is attached to the support structure, um, none of those are moving. All right. All right, let's turn these layers off. Just wanted to do a quick visual of that deformation pattern. Another thing that I want you to notice is that the original dimensions of plate ABCD, they're 90, meter, 90 millimeters by 120 millimeters. There's actually a, a typo, a righto, a thinko up here. Um, if you have an older copy of this and it says 90.3, please correct that to 90 millimeters. That is just an error. I apologize for the error. All right, let's see what this problem is asking us to do. Oh yeah, sorry, train of thought, train of thought. Okay, so we've got an error up here, you've corrected this, but what I was trying to, to, to explain when I noticed the error is that this drawing is not to scale, right? So I'm dimensioning from here to here and calling that 90 millimeters. See this dimension? That's 0.3 millimeters. So if I was drawing this to scale, you know, that point C would be moving really an indistinguishable amount far, um, farther in the deformed geometry than it is in the undeformed geometry. So just for the purpose of my drawing, I'm just greatly exaggerating the deformations. The drawing is nowhere near scale. All right. What are we asked to do? Part A says, what is the shear strain at point C or C prime? Okay, so we want to figure out solution to A, shear strain at, and that's a gamma for shear strain, shear strain at C or C prime is equal to what? We know that the definition of a shear strain is equal to the deformed angle minus the, uh, I'm sorry, the original angle minus the deformed angle. So the original angle is going to be theta. Here at C, do you see how that theta is going to be equal to 90 degrees or pi over 2 radians. And we are going to use radians consistently throughout these types of shear strain problems. You can solve them in degrees, but it is not typical to do that. We usually use radians for these ideas. All right. And so if we want to figure out the difference 
between undeformed angle theta, 90 degrees or pi over 2 radians, and deformed angle theta prime, we need to look at some angles. I'm going to zoom in over here. Get super duper up close and personal here to the deformed geometry. And what I want to do is set up some right triangles so I can calculate this little angle. I'm going to call that one alpha. I want to know this angle. I want to call this one beta. I'm just kind of inventing symbols. These symbols are not sacred, just kind of making stuff up as I go along. And here's where I can really see that my undeformed angle 90 degrees or pi over 2 is here. And then here is my deformed angle. Theta prime is unknown, but it looks like I can figure that out by taking my original angle pi over 2 and then subtracting out alpha and also subtracting beta. I'll do that um, in one more color. So in other words, there is my total angle. That's my undeformed angle. And what I want to do is subtract out alpha. Boop, boop, boop. OK, so we want to subtract out alpha. And then we want to subtract out beta. And that leaves us theta prime. In fact, if we look back at that definition of what shear strain is, so shear strain at C or C prime is equal to the original angle minus the new angle, we can see from this graphic that it's actually simply equal to alpha plus beta. If you're not picking up on that visually, here would be kind of the longer way to do it. You would say shear strain at C is equal to plug in pi over 2 for theta, subtract out theta prime, that is theta I'm sorry, pi over 2 minus alpha minus beta. Simplify that one goes away with that one. Now I just change these signs. So now I'm going to have alpha Oops, now I see what I did. This one right here. Sorry about that. This one needs a negative sign right there. OK, so I'm taking the whole and subtracting out the two little pieces. So now that I'm just kind of doing my mathematical um, operation, now a negative sign plus a negative sign turns into a positive sign. OK, so whether you can pick up on this relationship graphically or write out all of the terms. Either way, we now know that the shear strain at C is equal to alpha plus beta. I'm going to zoom out because now I need the macro geometry. I'm going to zoom out because I need the macro geometry, the geometry of the whole body. Yep, I think this will work. OK, I'll leave it like that. OK, so now I know that my strain at C, gamma sub C, is equal to alpha plus beta. And at this point, this is really just a um, trigonometry problem. So we need to figure out what alpha is. We need to figure out what beta is. And you can do this through using law of cosines. Um, my preference is to use right triangles when I can, even if sometimes it's like an extra step compared to the law of uh, cosines. Um, I tend to make fewer mistakes just using right triangles. So I'm going to choose to solve it that way. 
So I'm just going to use a different tool, actually. I'm going to grab this triangle. You see this right triangle right there. Let's put some color into that and turn down that intensity. All right, so we've got that yellow triangle up there at the top and it's got a height of 0.4 millimeters that's given. It's got a base of 90.3 millimeters there. So I'm going to use the tangent identity. And so I'm going to say that the tangent of alpha is equal to opposite over adjacent. That is 0 0.4 millimeters over 90.3 millimeters. Millimeters, of course, cancel out. You can either solve this, by the way, by using the tangent identity, or if you know anything about small angle theory, you'll recognize that this is actually that this angle is small. This classifies as small angle theory. So you actually could remove the tangent and just take the ratio. I'll go ahead and leave it um, in mind for now and just write alpha is equal to inverse tangent of the ratio 0 0.4 to 90.3. Okay, cool. Now let's figure out what beta is. I'll go back into my layers, turn this one off, add a new one, and let's find another right triangle. I'll do this one in blue. I think that'll show up a little bit better. Okay. My first line is going to go right down here. My second line is going to come over here. And I'm going to grab my hypotenuse there, color that light blue. And um, I think I'll just actually not even turn down the volume. I'll just kind of leave that as is, pop back to layer 13 so that I can write. OK, awesome. So now that is a right triangle that has a base of 0 0.3 minus 0 0.1. So this little dimension is 0 0.2 millimeters. The height of that right triangle, I just want to sum up. 120 plus 0.4 plus 0.2. That gives me a total of 120.6 millimeters for the height. And again, all I'm doing here is just geometry. You can do this with right triangles. You can do it with um, non-right triangles and apply the law of cosines if you prefer to do it that way. Set this up the same way. The tangent of angle beta opposite over hypotenuse, opposite to beta, beta lives right here, beta is that little tiny acute angle, is going to be 0 0.2 millimeters over the height of 120.6 millimeters. Just as before, you could use small angle theory here and get that tangent identity out of there, but I'll show it in its most precise way. So it's the ratio of 0.2 to 120.6. At this point, um, it's basically calculator time. So in order to answer the problem, all we have to do is substitute in alpha for wrong tool for this term. Compute beta. Plug that in for this term. Sum the two together and the answer you should get to that is 6.09 e minus 3 radians. Again, it is conventional to use radians and not degrees for shear strain. All right, so that is the end of the first part of this particular problem. Turn some of the layers off, get out of here, and get out of here. OK, cool. Let's proceed to the second part of the problem. And part B says, what is the shear strain at point D prime? What is the shear strain at point D prime? 
let's do the same thing. So I'm going to zoom in over here. Prior to deformation, theta d is equal to pi over 2 radians. Here is theta prime d. That's right here. And so what I want is to take out that angle and then also let's see I think I'm going to make this one I think I'm going to make this one dashed add in a little angle. All right, so let's think about this for a second. Find the 90 degrees. Find the 90 degrees in context. I'll draw this nice and big, maybe with a um, blue color I think would be better here. Here we go. There is the 90 degrees. And I'll even make it look more like an angular measurement by deleting all of that. Okay. Okay, so there's my 90 degrees. And that's where I can see that in order to figure out theta prime d, I need to be able to deduct this small angle I am going to choose to call that alpha I'm going to choose to call that alpha so I'm going to call this one angle alpha now I, I know I used alpha and beta by the way in the previous part and so it would be logical to go to gamma and del delta, except that gamma already means shear strain, which is going to be much more confusing. So I'm just going to do another throwaway alpha. This is a completely different one. So I'm still going to call these two little angles um, alpha and beta, but they're no relation to the ones that we used a little bit ago. All right, so there's my alpha. That one I have to deduct. And here is going to be my beta. And this angle I need to add. So this is going to be my beta, and that one I need to add. Okay, so let's write an expression mathematically that captures these ideas. Boop, boop. All right, so we know that we're asked to find what is the shear strain gamma at D, and the fundamental definition is that we're going to take the original angle, subtract the deformed angle, call that gamma. This is operation specific, by the way. There is a sign convention here. And here's kind of how it works. Assuming your original angle is 90 degrees or pi over 2, which is the case for most problems, if the angle you're deducting from that is smaller, then you'll get a positive shear strain. In other words, if the angle becomes more acute in the macro geometry, then you'll report the strain as positive. Now in the micro geometry, if I were to try to sketch a stress element um, right here, so if I were just to pop in a stress element right there, you'll see that two angles are becoming more acute, two angles are becoming more obtuse. So if I'm looking at the differential landscape, I would not use a sign for this shear strain. I would report the magnitude and then illustrate the directionality on a stress element. But if we're staying in the macro geometry, the overall angle there at D is becoming more acute. So I would do expect to get a positive sign out of my operation here. All right, let's continue. So we know that um, theta prime 
is equal to theta, 90 degrees, that's right here. That's the blue one that I've already got. Maybe I'll just label it again. I still feel like with all of these colors, I may be actually overcomplicating this rather than clarifying it. I hope that's not the case. It's just simple addition and subtraction of angles. Um, so don't let all the colors and marks overcomplicate things. And then as mentioned, we want to subtract alpha and we want to add beta. Okay, and I'll do this maybe with a black and then I'll just erase some of these marks to clean it up. But in other words, here is that 90 degrees benchmark that we're using. We want to take out alpha. We want to add beta. And that gives me theta prime at D. OK. In the next step, I'm just going to plug theta prime into my strain equation. So I'm going to say the strain at D equals theta minus plug in theta minus alpha plus beta. Now, just as before, and you'll see this pattern will always be the same on these types of problems, that pi over two term is gone. And we can simplify this as saying that the shear strain is equal to positive alpha minus beta or alpha minus beta. Now that we've finished our analysis down here at the differential level, now we can zoom back out to the macro level. I'll get rid of a lot of these lines. I think that one I'll keep. Slide this over here. Zoom in just a bit. I think that landscape's going to work well. OK, let's add in the triangles that we need for these angles. And I will do this with um, this blue line. Doop. Boop. OK, not perfect, but close enough. I think I need a bigger pen, and I'll do a similar thing for the other angle, and then we'll label them. I'm interested in this triangle, this one. I'll say again, you can do this with law of cosines if you would like to do so. I avoid that mathematical procedure if I can. Okay, hopefully that is close enough to what it is that we need to do. Lighten that a little bit and think through how these triangles and angles are defined. So we call this angle alpha, we call this angle beta, and we just wrote an expression that said the shear strain at D, gamma sub D, is equal to alpha minus beta. All right, and I'll reiterate again that I'm just using alpha and beta. As convenience, they have nothing to do, nothing whatsoever to the previous alpha and beta that we used up there at point C. It's like I've thrown that piece of paper away and kind of starting a new problem. OK, let's do alpha first. And I'm going to use that tangent identity again. So I need this height and I need this base. So the base is 90.1 millimeters, adding those two things together, and the height is given as 0 0.2 millimeters. I'm going to go here just a second. Lots of layers, lots of complexity here. I think we're done with the context, so I'm just going to cut all this out of my drawing. That way we don't have to worry about it. All right, so now we can write an expression such as 
In fact, I'm just going to plug in directly just to save a step. So I'm going to plug in for alpha. So that's the inverse tangent of opposite over adjacent. Opposite is 0 0.2. Adjacent is 90.1. Units are millimeters. They cancel out. So I can look at that as a ratio. Copy the negative sign. And now we're going to do angle beta. All right. So this triangle has this little base. That would be 0.3 millimeters minus 0.1 millimeters equals 0 0.2 millimeters. And the base of that triangle is 120 plus 0.4 plus 0.2. That adds up to a total of 120.6 millimeters for the total height of that triangle. So for beta, I want to do inverse tangent. The opposite to beta is 0 0.2. The adjacent to beta is 120.6. It's a ratio. The millimeters cancel out. Um, work this through, through in your calculator, and you should get 561 E minus 6 radians. Teeny, teeny, tiny little angle, or teeny, teeny, tiny little uh, shear strain better way to say that. Um, and that's the answer that you should get for point D. Uh, the last part of this problem is less convoluted than doing all of this geometry stuff. And it's just saying, OK, you figured out the shear strain at point D. Now can you determine the shear stress at point D? And so we're going to use our fundamental relationship between shear stress and shear strain in the linearly elastic range. And I mentioned this in class. For those of you that are in my class, uh, maybe if you are some random person on the internet, you haven't heard this before. But if we were to plot shear strain and shear stress, um, we know that this material is flexible. We don't know anything else about it. But the assumption, if you're not told anything else, is that all given problems are within the linearly elastic range of the material. And maybe it goes nonlinear over here. We don't really know. But we're just going to use this part of the shear stress strain curve. And we know that the slope of the shear stress strain curve in the linearly elastic range is equal to the shear modulus. That goes by the symbol capital G. All right, let's go ahead and finish this problem up. Finish in orange. OK, so the shear modulus G is defined as the ratio of shear stress to shear strain within the linearly elastic range of the material. We are asked to solve for a stress. We know a modulus, 80 gigapascals. Oh, and it does say, actually, <laughs> it's been a while since I've worked this problem. Um, so it is made out of steel. So yes, it will have a linearly elastic uh, shear stress strain curve and then go inelastic later in the stress strain curve. But we know the modulus and we know the strain. That's what we just solved for. So we can kind of plug and chug here. All right, so we know, just rearrange this equation, shear stress is equal to modulus times strain plug in 80 gigapascals, shear strain. And here I want to use all digits. And I'm not working these calculations live. So I don't remember the fourth sig fig here. But carry all sig figs, even if we just report three as answers, you still want to carry um, a fourth, if not more, in your calculator. Multiply that out by radians and shear stress to three sig figs, you're going to get 44.9 E minus three gigapascals. But that is not the best way to describe that concept. I'm going to do this conversion, divide by a thousand. We're going to express this as 44.9 megapascals. Okay, so I know in some of your science classes, you're asked to use base units such as pascals, newtons, and meters. In engineering, 
practice, it is common to use units that are at the right order of magnitude for what you're talking about. For stresses, we're almost always going to be talking in units of megapascals. That is the end of this problem. Long video. Thanks for watching. I hope this was helpful.